YouTube. We are going to start today's meeting just uh, before uh, opening the meeting and welcoming our dear guests. Just the reminders of keeping your microphones uh, muted and keep your questions ready for the post session of questions and answers. Uh, you can whether raise your hand or write the questions on the chat box. And uh, also for those who are watching us on YouTube, you can also type your questions there. So there we will convey to our lecturer. Mm -hmm. So um, today for us, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this session. All our dear friends from India and abroad to this public lecture of our dear sister Sabine van Osta uh, from Belgium entitled Light on the Path. Hints for a Happy Life that is organized by Fragia CS Studio as a part of an effort to take the opportunities given by this pandemic to spread the theosophical teachings beyond the frontiers. And uh, before introducing our speaker of today, uh, I will request all of you to come in silence, get comfortable and repeat along with me the universal prayer. Oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. Oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May all who feel themselves as one with thee know they are therefore one with every other. Well, now it is my pleasure to introduce Sister Sabine, Sabine Van Osta. Sabine Van Osta was born in 1968, and she is in an active member of the Theosophical Society since 2001. She became Lodge President of White Lotus Lodge in 2008 board member of the Belgian section from 2004 till 2008 and back since 2012. At the end of 2013, she was designated general secretary of the section. Apart from the organizational work, she gives lectures and animates study groups in Belgium and the Netherlands on core theosophical themes in Dutch, French, and English. She is also a translator. She translates texts on theosophical and religious themes, and also a writer. Her own articles were published in various theosophical publications. In daily life, Sabine works since 1998, full-time as executive assistant. Currently, she lives in Antwerp, Belgium, with her husband and her lovely ginger cat. So, dear sister Sabine, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation to be today here with all of us. And now, please, the uh, report is all yours. I will start with thanking you for this very kind introduction um, and for being offered the opportunity to indeed share some of the ideas that come up with me um, on uh, the text of light on the path. It's not just my ideas. I will probably also repeat some of the ideas that have been um, clarified by others. And I will also say which others where to find interesting uh, things on light on the path. And so thank you very much for having this great idea because it also gives me the idea of asking Shikar to give a lecture with us in Belgium over Zoom. So that's how we cooperate theosophically. I, I really love it. Thank you very much. So I will now start uh, sharing my screen and um, with the title of the book 
that we will, will be studying very briefly. And just for my, um, my idea, I guess I need to talk around one hour or so, but definitely not more. Shikar? Or Catalina? Yes, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I was not, I was not muted. <laughs> I was not unmuted. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you have more than one hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. then we will open for 10 to 15 minutes. And then we open questions. well. I'll see because I prefer rather shorter uh, contributions than longer because I believe that uh, we need to live our life in the world and not in front of a PC screen. But of course, we, uh, we have something very interesting here in front of us, light on the pad. And um, you also have seen that I had put a, a subtitle, Hints for a Happier Life. I will not talk about that subtitle yet, but maybe some questions come up as we go along. So uh, we'll see about that. Light on the path. Uh, I guess many of you have, or I at least I hope, many of you have read it once. And there is a silent hope that certain people might even read it regularly. And maybe some of you, you never know, know it by heart. But that's probably a bit too much to ask. But anyway, if you read it very regularly, then this is typically the kind of thing that could happen. Um, we recall the very good habit uh, in, in lamasaries and in, in Tibetan monasteries where uh, young children who enter the monastery are. Uh, obliged to start learning by heart texts and specifically in Western education systems, uh, people have done away a bit by learning by heart certain things because we need to reason and apply logic, etc. But there are really advantages of knowing certain things by heart, specifically uh, texts of wisdom, because by the time that you are ready to retreat in your Himalayan cage, you don't need the book anymore because you have it in you. And Light on the Path is exactly the kind of text, not that I know it by heart, but that I would also recommend all of us to very regularly take into our hands it's a small book, but maybe too much to read it, but just to have a few verses, so now and then, and to ponder upon. It is like a workbook, so to say. And we will um, tell a bit more about it in a minute or so. It is not the only book um, of that kind within theosophical literature. There's actually three of them, which are usually mentioned, cited, in, in one go, and I'll try to get to the next slide. There you have it. And that is what we call the Theosophical Ethical Classics. And Light on the Pad, as we can see, was the first one. And it was written down by Mabel Collins, a lady who was a, a very close uh, collaborator with uh, Helena Blavatsky at the end of uh, the 19th century, and uh, she was particularly um, working together with uh, Mrs. Blavatsky on the magazine Lucifer. Um, and then the, the next theosophical ethical classic that we encounter a few years afterwards, these are the dates of the first editions that I mentioned, it was the voice of the silence. Many of, new, of you will probably know that one as well. Uh, a text that was written down by Mrs. Blavatsky from her memory, three fragments of a text specifically for Chelas, for Lanus, as it is said. Uh, so also a, a book, a workbook, a book of practices of 
let's admit it already, a more advanced kind of inner practice. And then the third one of the theosophical ethical classics is at the feet of the masters. And it also has a very, a very special history of, um, or a very special origin, because this was the text that was written down by the very young Yidu Krishnamurti, known under his mystical name of Alcyon. It was first published at the beginning of the previous century. And uh, he sort of also was a bit of a recollection that the things that he recalled on his voyage together with Charles Ledbetter, the voyage going to the ashram of the master and then coming back and then writing down what he had heard and what he had received as also a very sublime and a very pure instruction for the inner life and something that can be applied by all of us. So this is the kind of text that we are dealing with uh, today. And in fact, as I said, Light on the Path is a kind of manual for the inner life with instructions how to deal with us and how to deal with our surroundings. Apart from that, I would like to typify um, Light on the Path also as a friend for life. And that's really what it is. It is our best friend. It's one of the best friends that we can have. So we should cherish it. Why? Because it contains messages and it conveys information by beings who actually live in eternity. It's by beings who live where, so to say, although that is quite relative speaking, but by beings who live where we as human beings are supposed to be going. So they tell us a bit about what is awaiting us after we have gone through the whole stage of human development. And not only that, it also tells us how to get there. And that's the most interesting thing of all. So, in fact, the life that, by the way, each of the theosophical classics is trying to lead us to is a kind of life that is completely different of the life that we currently know wherever we are on the planet. There's very few people who actually just know to go there where they want us to lead. It is quite a thorny path. It is quite a small path as we shall see. We will also see that light on the path, it uses a certain language simply for the fact that it tells us about uh, a completely other realm of existence that we know. You cannot just bluntly start to describing it in the language, ordinary language, economic, social, common language. You actually need a bit a special style. And there are, to talk about that other world that we are supposed to be um, um, uh, reaching, you can have a number of language styles that can very much help you. A first one is poetry. If you want to talk about something as subtle as spiritual realities, poetry is usually a good point to start. Another um, technique, language technique, so to say, or style, to talk about spiritual life can be the parable. And there are many parables that we know of, um, Bhagavad Gita being one of them, all the great epic uh, works of world literature in general, 
the Bible was something that uses quite often parables. So there too, they are actually this kind of stories were a workbook in, in their own right, because they also put us at work to go and digest the verities that they expand. And then another style that is being used, and it is primarily used amongst others in Light on the Path, is the paradox. Something which at first glance is completely contradictory. You know, first do this, but then do that. And that's something completely different. But it invites us even more so, it compels us to start thinking on other levels and to not just think with our head, but also, more importantly, with our heart. Because that's the thing that needs to happen in the end. We will see about it because, of course, we will be diving into the text as we go along. Um, I just wanted to uh, give this as a complement of information for people who want to know a bit more about Light on the Path. Um, there have been a number of commentaries uh, written on them, on, on Light on the Path. Uh, there is, of course, the very well-known work by Annie Besant and Charles Ledbetter, the third volume of their talks on the path of occultism. It's quite a big book with a lot of clarification and by Dr. Besant and by Charles Ledbetter. But there are also the works of um, Rohit Mehta, Seek Out the Way, or Joy Mills, Entering on the Sacred Way. Um, there was, I believe, there's also a book by Sri Ram on, on Light on the Path. And then, of course, in our age, there are a number of uh, series that have been recorded uh, specifically by uh, the Theosophical Society in America, uh, by amongst others, uh, Pablo Sender, and if I am um, correct, also by uh, John Algio, if I am correct, I might be uh, confounding here with the voice of the silence. But so there is a lot of material available should you wish to dive deep into a light on the path or if it needs be any other of the, 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 the two or the three theosophical ethical classics. This by means of uh, introduction to our theme of today. And I will be basing myself, and now I have lost my little booklet, it's, but I am basing myself on the 1982 edition of ADR just to make sure, because of course there have been a number of editions throughout the century. When you take the title page of Light on the Path, you will see that it is qualified as a treatise written for the personal use of those who are ignorant of the Eastern wisdom and who desire to enter within its influence. Now, I haven't found really um, at what point this uh, sentence has been added to the title page. We will see that in a moment, how Light on the Path came to be as a text. Um, but if it is so that it was something added at the moment that Mabel Collins has received this text, then of course we're talking about end of the 19th century. And then we understand that it was also specifically given to uh, people more in the West who are indeed ignorant of the Eastern wisdom. And so who wants to get in touch with the Eastern wisdom? So out of that, I would see a logic, but that assumes that this sentence would be added to um, the title page at the moment that Mabel Collins wrote it down. But that was not really the sole moment 
that this text and this material came to the West. Uh, there was before that already a moment when that came to be. And that has all to do with how, where the text originates from. It is said, and this you can read in the introduction that Charles Ledbetter has uh, written. He has prefaced it with a certain number of informations which are, which are very useful to, um, to get a hold of what we are dealing with here in terms of wisdom. It is a fragment, he says, of the Book of Golden Precepts. And the first time that it was written down was on a palm leaf manuscript of 30 verses only in archaic, meaning very old Sanskrit. The kind of manuscript that there is a very fine collection in the Adyar Library this kind of thing. And by that time, you know, it must be very old, very ancient. By the time of the life of Jesus Christ, people didn't already recollect anymore where it actually came from. They had already forgotten when these verses were for the first time written down. So it is as old as that. And then this old text was translated into Greek by the Venetian master. It isn't really specified at what, mo at what moment. Um, for some, it might be interesting to know, of course, but Let's say that for the big trail of wisdom, it is, it is less important. The Venetian master, he made that translation for his own pupils. One of them being the one we now know of as Master Hilarion. And the Venetian master, he provided here and there between the 30 verses, he provided with some further explanation on the principle that was given. And then next, and then we get a bit closer to the moment probably where Mabel Collins receives this teaching. Next, the text is translated from Greek into English by Master Hilarion. And he, on his turn, starts to provide with certain notes, not with all verses, but with some of them, clarifying again on the mechanisms, on the ideas, and on the principles of inner life that light on the path is providing. And so you will see in any um, edition that you can now buy or, or find online, you will see these three instances, just the, the crude verses, and they are very short. You know, they, they really didn't need many words to explain or to, to tell what they had to tell the, the, the ancient sages. And then the uh, clarifications by the Venetian master, and then on top of that, the notes by Master Hilarion. And we will read some of them. Of course, we will not be able to read all of, um, all of the book. It is a bit too big for that. But the idea is also to um, dive together into the wisdom and to um, learn to each other to how to see the depth of the teaching that has been given in light on the path. Is it possible that there already is a question? Um, should I continue or should I take the questions as uh, in between? Uh, I guess you can continue and we will uh, open the questions. Okay, very good. At the end. Yes. Very good. So the very first thing that we read in Light on the Path is the introduction. And even before that introduction, it says 
these rules are written for all disciples. Attend you to them. There we go. It might be already a bit contradictory because we just saw on the title page that it was explicit, explicitly addressed to the people who are ignorant of Eastern wisdom and who should like to get in touch with Eastern wisdom. But here we are really already in the base of the text and there it says, these rules are written for all disciples. Attend you to them, meaning what is a disciple? Well, one of the many definitions you could give, not that it's the only one, is a disciple, he tends to put into practice what he reads or what he learns about. He's not just content by reading a book and then go along. No, no, you, a disciple is someone you can read, of course, it's, it's okay to read. I love reading, so it's okay to read, but it doesn't stay there. It, it isn't limited to just the reading, to just the ingesting, but you work on it, you assimilate, and you put into practice the principle that you have digested, the principle that you have assimilated from the teaching. And that's why it's also said, attend you to them, put it into practice. I just said, you can read a book and then uh, you put into practice uh, what, you, what you read, but the book is not the only thing that we can read. We will probably not get as far as to read the second part of uh, Light on the Path, but at some point in that second part, it is said that we should also learn to, it's not literally what I'm going to say now, but that we should also try to read life itself. To look in nature and to learn to read nature like a book. And it tells us loads nature just by the way how it is organized, just by the way how it is harmonized. Everything responds or connects to everything in a very unique and a very appropriate way. We humans can learn a load from nature. And that too is actually a way of complying with this attend you to them because these rules you could also come up with them in nature itself when you would meditate on the things that you see around you so these rules are written for all disciples attend you to them and then we get um, a bit more text on what to do next before the eyes can see, they must be incapable of tears. Before the ear can hear, it must have lost its sensitiveness. Before the voice can speak in the presence of the masters, it must have lost the power to wound. And then finally, before the soul can stand in the presence of the masters, it's the, it's the, its feet must be washed in the blood of the heart. This is already some quite forceful language, isn't it? Specifically the last one. You might say, ooh, what's this? The blood of the heart? But of course, we are here in the symbolic language. In the sort of poetic language it's 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 full of symbols the main thought that i would uh, get out of this uh, is that we try to get rid of 
the conditioning of our senses, the life of our senses. Our eyes, they must be incapable of tears. You would, you might say, well, isn't that a bit insensitive? I mean, uh, what, what about compassion? Yes, we need to be compassionate, but we don't need to be taken away by our emotions. So this hints also towards an inner stability of some kind. A well-poised inner attitude. And the same thing for the ear. Before the ear can hear, it must have lost its sensitiveness. We often hear things that we don't like. Very often. Even things that are really personally said to us that we find a bit hurtful. Well, in fact, we need to go beyond that. Whether someone says something nice about us or whether they say something hurtful to us, it shouldn't matter. We should just go on and cut through that. Cut through the liking, the like or the dislike of things around us. So it goes a bit in the same direction as the first sentence. And the third sentence, it adds to that. Before the voice can speak in the presence of the masters, it must have lost the power to wound. It is a very important one. In certain schools, uh, they make it a big deal what you do with speech how you handle your speech and how to get at pure speech, never wounding anyone. And so it uh, appears that actually it's better to keep silent than to talk at all. <laughs> if you want to know um, or have an, another source that uh, I have come to know is for instance, uh, Thomas Akempis. He was a 15th century mystic in, uh, in Holland. And uh, he has written this small book, uh, The Imitation of Christ. Uh, well, <laughs> you need to be, um, how shall I put it, well on the road to lose your sensitiveness before you can actually read it. Because in average, I think that a lot of people would sometimes feel a bit hurt by the things that he writes down. But still, it goes into the same trail of thought as we encounter here in Light on the Path. We must lose the power to wound with our speech. So our speech should always be kind. Always be becoming. Um, and if we really don't find anything to nice to say, then it is better not to speak at all. But always try to find a positive way of talking about our environment, even if then it's, I can imagine it's quite a difficult thing to do, specifically in our world today. Before the soul can stand in the presence of the masters, its feet must be washed in the blood of the heart. Now that too is a hard one. It pinpoints directly towards the heart, a pure heart. Those of you who are familiar with um, the, golden, the golden stairs, they know about this. It's one of the conditions uh, to be admitted to greater wisdom, to be admitted to an ashram, etc. We need a pure heart. And our heart is a very important, it's not only the most important organ that we have, but also spiritually speaking, it is a very important center. Because it is there, if you read some of the mystics, it is there where we can meet God, so to say. But before we can do that, 
it needs to be absolutely pure. And this means to get to get rid of a whole lot of things where light on the path, again, will be giving instruction later on. And so we now go uh, straight into the instructions on uh, and the first one. We just see how far we get um, before we have to uh, cut off. So I didn't really, uh, we, we just see where we get. The first one, the first three of them, kill out ambition, kill out desire of life, kill out desire of comfort. Just three instructions like that. And we recall that it is a book addressed to disciples. I will read you the note that Hilarion has written. So each time you see the word note, it means that there will be a clarification by Hilarion uh, in connection with that instruction. And Hilarion says as follows. Ambition is the first curse the great tempter of the man who is rising above his fellows. It is the simplest form of looking for reward. Men of intelligence and power are led away from their highest possibilities by it continually. Yet, it is a necessary teacher. It results turn to dust and ashes in the mouth. Like death and estrangement, it shows the man at last that to work for self is to work for disappointment. But though this first rule seems so simple and easy, do not quickly pass by it. For these vices of the ordinary man pass through a subtle transformation and reappear with changed aspect in the heart of the disciple. Already one origin for the blood of the heart in which we put our feet in if we want to stand in the presence of the masters, isn't it? I continue. It is easy to say, I will not be ambitious. It is not so easy to say, when the master reads my heart, he will find it clean utterly. The pure artist who works for the love of his work is sometimes more firmly planted on the right road than the occultist who fancies he has removed his interest from self, but who has in reality only enlarged the limits of experience and desire and transferred his interest to things which concern his larger span of life. The same principle applies to the other two seemingly simple rules. For now, at the threshold, a mistake can be corrected. But carry it on with you, and it will grow and come to fruition. Or else you must suffer bitterly in its destruction. And so it is this destruction of that ambition into that growing concern, working for self, that is the actual source or the blood of the heart that washes our feet before we can stand in the presence of the master. 
the comments of Hilarion are, of course, very useful to catch the actual content of the instruction. And we talked earlier about the palm leaf and the 30 verses, just like that. And they are all as concise as this. Kill out ambition, kill out desire of life, kill out desire of comfort. But they all contain this depth of meaning. And so it is light on the path of the three theosophical classics. You just can take one sentence like that and continue for a whole week to meditate upon that. Or for instance, use this book uh, when at the end of the day, you want to evaluate how your day has gone, where you might have gone astray, people you might have hurt, people who have hurt you, and see how to deal with that and how to clean your life, how to clean your eyes, how to clean your ear, and how to clean your voice. And because of all that, how to clean your heart. Because that's the thing that matters most when you are serious, as all disciples are, when you are serious to tread the path. After these three, and it is actually the same for many other verses, but after these three, we get a clarification by the Venetian master. And it goes as follows. Work as those who are ambitious. What? They just told us to kill out ambition. So what is this? Well, work as those work who are ambitious. Respect life as those who desire it. Be happy as those are who live for happiness. Seek in the heart the source of evil and expunge it. It lives fruitfully in the heart of the devoted disciple as well as in the heart of the man of desire. Only the strong can kill it out. The weak must wait for its growth, its fruition, its death. And it is a plant that lives and increases throughout the ages. It flowers when the man has accumulated unto himself innumerable existences. He who will enter upon the path of power must tear this thing out of his heart. And then the heart will bleed. And the whole life of man seems to be utterly dissolved. This ordeal must be endured. It may come at the first step of the perilous ladder, which leads to the path of life. It may not come until the last, but, O oh, disciple, Remember that it has to be endured and fasten the energies of your soul upon the task. Live neither in the present nor the future, but in the eternal. This giant weed cannot flower there. This blot upon existence is wiped out by the very atmosphere of eternal thought. This brilliant clarification by the Venetian master gives us indeed a hint, as I said before, to where it is that we should be going, what we should be paying attention to if we want to go there. And it seems contradictory, but it is not 
if you are aware that the zone, the inner zone that we need to go, the spiritual realm that we are aiming at is of a completely different nature than the, the, the realm of existence as we know it here in incarnated life. And that's the only way in which you can actually solve the paradoxes. And so just as well as Hilarion and his master, the Venetian master, they give some very important clues as to how to do it. And again, this is a book, it is fine to read it just with your mental, but more important still is to read this kind of book with the heart and to ponder long upon the principles that are being explained because you can actually never come have, have discovered all the wealth of wisdom that is contained in the principles and in the verses. Seek in the heart the source of evil and expunge it. And again, we have seen um, that the blood of the heart, well, it actually comes from there. If the plant of ambition, which originates in the work of self, and we let it grow, we will have a hell lot of work to get it out. And I see Shikar in the image. Um, do I still have time, Shikar? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. You, you tell me when to stop because I could go on for a week, you know. Okay, sure, sure. sure. No problem. I'll let you know. Thank okay. you. Um, very interesting that in this uh, clarification by the Venetian, we also see the wheat must wait for its growth and its fruition of the plant of ambition and its death. So there is a natural evolution, all right, there is a cycle also in that ambition, and maybe some of us have recognized this already in their own life, that at some points you find certain things important, then when time goes along, all of a sudden you don't find it that important anymore. And it is very easy to say goodbye to certain things. I know of many people who have, for instance, embraced a vegetarian lifestyle they started their life by loving meat and then at certain point in time it was actually very easy to let go of it it has grown and then it dies out and you can just very easily cast aside the same thing can be said of also our inner characteristics our personality traits we all might find some indesirable in personality traits. And in the same kind of uh, principle, we might also try to cast those aside. Uh, we know of a, one of the brilliant books written by I.K. Timney, A Way to Self-Development, where he exactly explains in a very theosophical way how this, how this, comes about to purify one's inner nature, our emotions and our, our, our mental uh, body, so to say. So it is also a very good preparation as to um, the, the exercise, so to say, that we receive from the Venetian. And then the heart will bleed and the whole life of man seems to be utterly dissolved. Very interesting again to see the situation, a life being utterly dissolved. Of course, uh, we have all come by situation, situations where we thought, oh gosh, now I am really a bit, you know, the ground has gone away under my feet. I, I, I feel also very vulnerable. I feel very weakened. But maybe if you consider them from another point of view, those are particularly the moments where 
from a spiritual angle, we can make the most progress. Maybe those situations where we feel actually lost contain, contain also uh, the most potential to make, spiritually speaking, a leap ahead. And so these situations, rather than aspiring for despair, might perhaps become a fountain, a source for hope. And I guess this is a, a message that is quite an important one for many people in our world today, because many are suffering and in sometimes in terrible life circumstances. I guess I could still have a few minutes for just three verses. Yeah, sure, sure. So, just three. Oh. Instructions five, six, and seven. Kill out all sense of separateness. Kill out desire for sensation. Kill out the hunger for growth. Specifically, number six, kill out desire for sensation. It need not to uh, surprise us if we read carefully the introductory verses where there was purification of the senses, the ear, the speech, etc. But Hilarion has still something extra to say about this. And then I guess uh, by the time we're done with that uh, shikar, we, we, will be, we will be done. So Hilarion about kill out all sense of separateness. Do not fancy you can stand aside from the bad man or the foolish man. They are yourself though in a less degree than your friend or your master. But if you allow the idea of separateness from any evil thing or person to grow up within you, by so doing, you create karma which will bind you to that thing or person till your soul recognizes that it cannot be isolated. Remember that the sin and shame of the world are your sin and shame. For you are a part of it. Your karma is inextricably interwoven with the great karma. And before you can attain knowledge, you must have passed through all places, foul and clean alike. Therefore, Remember that the soiled garment you shrink from touching may have been yours yesterday, may be yours tomorrow. And if you turn with horror from it, when it is flung upon your shoulders, it will cling the more closely to you. The self-righteous man makes for himself a bed of Maya. Abstain, because it is right to abstain, not that yourself shall be kept clean. A very, very important one. Because, of course, um, we might have tendency to think of us ourselves as better than other people for whatever reason, because of a job, because of the fact that we have read books, because of the fact that we have written books, because of the fact that we have given a lot of lectures, because of whatever reason, because we have a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. But those are all things of the world. And also there, we need to cut through it we need to see and learn to see further than that because they are of no importance whatsoever when the final stage comes of taking the leap into the spiritual. 
And so it is not as much that we ourselves want to keep clean. It is more wanting to do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. And because it resonates with our heart to do just the right thing. I guess that by now we might be ready for the questions. Thank you, Sister Sabine. And it was really, uh, I think no matter how many times we read, listen, or hear these aphorisms, it has so much of uh, effect on the mind. And the way you shared it and presented it was also very, very touching and inspiring. And of course, the importance of the motive in the end that you were saying, that why we do something, why we uh, walk, why one walks the spiritual path is of utmost important and we should sometimes do an introspection on that. So thank you so much for that. And now we uh, open the floor and we request all our delegates, if they have any questions or any other inputs, they are most welcome to do that. And to begin with, uh, we have Brother Balaji Narayan Swami. He has raised his hand. If you could uh, switch on your video, Brother Balaji, I can, and you can unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please, yeah, audible. ma'am. Uh, ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the excellent session you have taken. Uh, I would like to ask: in spirituality, uh, when we move, normally they used to say that we have to be in mindfulness. That means we should not be in the past or we should not be in the future. So uh, normally there is a school of thought which says we should be in mindfulness. And now here, when we go through this particular session of art, we say we have to be in eternal. So can you ma'am just uh, tell this connection, how is there, is, is it both same or is there Between any difference? mindfulness and the eternal, you mean? Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. definitely. Well, um, I only know about mindfulness because I once followed the school of the wisdom by uh, Fernando de Torrijos. And it was a very useful thing indeed, because it learns you to, um, as goes by the way, the theme of the International Congress, it learns you to live in the now, right? to live in the present moment. Um, the eternal, on the other hand, can be, in my belief, accessible when indeed you come into perfectly living in the now and being perfectly concentrated in the now. And it is part of probably a meditational process. So um, there is no contradiction. The one in my feeling is an access point to the other mindfulness. And so it, it, it is a fact I recall from explanations from Aki Taimi when he says, uh, like, look, uh, a yogi, an accomplished yogi, he knows how to get out of the eternal and indeed be here, here in the now when it is needful to be there and then go back in samadhi, so at will. So there is no real uh, contradiction. I believe that mindfulness as a technique for fully entirely, completely living in the now is a connection point towards life in the eternal, of which it is very difficult, as I said, to get an idea of it, but um, who is actually our foreland, so to say, and our goal uh, to, to try to reach it in, in this life, well, preferably in this life. I know, of course, within theosophy, we say, Look, um, 
there is uh, this um, doctrine of incarnation. So uh, happily, we, we come back a few times, you know, to learn certain lessons that maybe we didn't learn this time. Um, but definitely, it doesn't mean that uh, reincarnation is there uh, because we might get lazy and uh, not feel like learning our lessons in this life and we take it the next time. I don't think that is the right thing to do. So, But mindfulness, yes, a portal to, to the eternal. I hope this is uh, a bit of an adequate uh, answer to your question, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Brother Balaji, for bringing out a valuable question and equally even more valuable answer by Sister Sabine. And now uh, we have Brother Jyoti CS. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hello. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Sir. Congratulations for a wonderful speech you just given. So, as a common man, how we can go with spirituality and family life? That is a simple question uh, that I'm a youngster in this field, so just I need a comment from you on this. Thank you, ma'am. In connection with the family life, um, actually, um, it connects very well with the last note that I have read, the one from Hilarion who says, you need not to think too easily that you are far from the evil man, etc." cetera. Um, we believe that we need ideal circumstances to be able to tread the path. And actually, that is not entirely the case. The fact of the matter is, we are in our life as we are now. We have our family. We have very often our jobs. We have our circumstances. And that is, for all of us, the starting point. That's where we all begin. And so it is a fact that in family life, you have a wealth of opportunities to also learn to deal and with yourself and with others. And as things stand now, I even believe that family life is a sort of highway in spiritual development. There's only one thing, you need to try to once or twice a day, take a few moments to reflect upon things, how they went, how you dealt with your family members, the people at work, etc., and really seriously and with an earnest heart, because that's the whole point. You need an earnest heart and an earnest motivation to have an honest look at that and how you did and how the others did and how your reaction was and how it feels, and how you feel about it. And just digest every life's experience that comes up. It doesn't matter where it is. You don't need to be in a Himalayan cage to get, to get a bit of spiritual development. So I would say, um, just continue with an honest life, an open spirit, and in the end, we even not need very elaborate and complicated theories and techniques and, and, and all of that. In fact, to be very present in your actual situation and to learn also to get more and more sensitive to the needs of the people around you, I guess that is a very important one to indeed make some progress as you go along but it should not be your goal to make progress it should be your goal to be good towards others it's a very difficult one because very often people are not good with us that's the real exercise to do that's the real one i hope this was uh, more or less useful for you as a as a tip 
Thank you, and man. Thank you. And it's a tip for myself and for everybody else at the same time. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Sabine. And thank you for the Jyoti. Uh, before I just take up a next question, there are many messages in the chat thanking you, Sister Sabine, for a wonderful, wonderful. and inspiring thank presentation. You You're a kind audience. And uh, there is a comment from Brother Raman, S. Raman, Secretary of Madras Theosophical Federation that the light of the path was first of three treatises which occupy unique position in our theosophical literature, direction from those who have trodden path to those who desire to tread it. Its precepts had several depths of meaning which are revealed to the spiritual aspirants as progress is made from one level to another meant for practical guidance for a spiritual seeker. And I read it because uh, it relates somehow with the query we received on a chat regarding these teachings, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, that these teachings are given in a paradoxical manner. So why are these teachings given in such paradoxical manner and not in a direct manner? If you can throw some light or share your views on that. Well, uh, in fact, they are given in this paradoxical manner um, to indeed um, encourage us to go beyond the mere concrete mental plane of and mental way of thinking, of pure logical thinking, for the simple reason that there are things that go beyond that. And so we need, we human beings need to be encouraged to go beyond. And the paradox is one of the ways to do that. And as I said, the parable is an other way to do that. But then again, there too, you could take a parable just like a nice story. Well, it's a nice story. I, I feel entertained. It's a very nice story. But and if you go and, and watch, for instance, many um, movies, now I limit myself these last years to only watch child movies, you know, from Pixar and Walt Disney and so, <laughs> because they are in their own way, they are also like parables. The characters, they represent certain elements in us, outside us. Yeah? And the parable is the same thing. So the different characters and the different elements, they stand for something. Every good novel works like that. And they learn us always more than the, the first reading of the story. And then poetry, same thing. Huh? Poetry tries to, not that you can, you cannot attain that, that level of existence, but it tries to pinpoint us towards that level of existence but it cannot be said you cannot just simply say it you always need a little something in your use of language to get there and to encourage people to go there i hope that was a bit uh, yeah. uh, uh yeah. so it means the way forward is as you mentioned uh, in your talk that take an aphorism and meditate on it for a week uh, yes or some time and that meditation or contemplation will clean the eyes, ears, and finally the heart. So I think that's a very important thing that each of one of us must take them and meditate on as long as we get some more insights. Uh, any more questions uh, or anybody would like to share some thoughts? I see Professor Shinde is here. And he has given also many talks on light on the path. If you would like to share something. Imagine. Yeah. Yes, please, Thank you, Sister Sabina. Very nicely you have brought to this teachings of light on the path. In the morning only I quoted this, kill out ambition. And what uh, Radha Bernier said about this, is really wonderful. She said, she asked, does the self-center continues to exist or has it died? Does the self-center continues to exist or has it died? 
If one says I have put an end to ambition, I know one must not put an end to the self because it continues in the form of myself, the knower. This is how it is a crux. We must end our <laughs> this psychological center which says me and mine. That is very nicely Radha Barnier once he explained. Yeah. Uh, just I want to uh, bring here there is a wonderful uh, statement look for the flower to bloom in the silence that follow the storm and uh, now we are in this silence actually there was storm for three days here in the rain and we are in this silence and uh, it is also said not till then and I am thinking of, there are 10 palm leaves. Each palm leaf has got, as you said, three lines. And every verse, every palm leaf has got three lines. Why three? It is really, uh, one has to contemplate. Because even part second also, there are 12 rules. Three of them, they speak about metaphor of warrior. Three of them, they think about metaphor of music. Like this, three, three, they are given. I was thinking deeply, what, what is the aim of using? I am in the treasure of palm leaves here in Adair library. And only 10 leaves and each has got three lines. Probably it is said, those who ask shall have. That is one line. Those that desire shall read or get and those who desire to learn shall learn. So under his guidance, we have to carry on our work. That is what it says. Because all the rules, I am just adding Shabina, I am not giving anything as such, but these are the hints not for the West only, for the East also. Because in his direction, we have to acquire first. And we must develop our ability of sight, ability of true hearing, ability of true speech, ability of true uh, standing before the one who is perfect. So all the four rules are also for everyone, even if he is in the daily life. We don't have, that is what the international president once asked that question, that uh, may I see what I see? <laughs> this wonderful question and uh, you have given us very nice talk. We are always happy to listen light on the path with various uh, speakers, lecturers, because it throws definitely some light for our understanding. Thank you very much Thank for you. giving Thank you, nice Dr. talk Shri. on such a treatise. Which Thank is you. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Shindeji. And I don't see any more questions. If, if there are any more questions or queries, please uh, raise your hand or we will close, go proceed for the closing session, but okay, there are no more hands. And so, ah, okay, mm -hmm. Taral Munshiji, Taral Munshiji, you have a question. Unmute. Unmute yourself, Taralji, unmute yourself. Uh, kindly unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, can. Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm operating from a very limited device today. Uh, I just want to say that uh, entire talk of yours was uh, just flowing like a river on the small pebbles of pointers set by you on the uh, 
those pointers were so beautifully said by you that it on those pebbles the entire top was flowing like a river and its tinkle will remain forever in my thoughts and your formula that first slide if i remember it was e e v s that is e eyes ear voice and soul that i am always going to remember wonderful thank you so much thank, thank you, you sir thank, thank you, you. e e v s Karanji, and before we proceed to closing, just some final words from Sister Sabine, if you want to say just some tip or some thing, if you have any. Well, um, I would have thought to uh, because the subtitle was hints for a happy life, and of course, if you look at this type of material from the point of view of the personality then all you can say is there is no happy life because actually it needs to disappear. So it's not such a good news for the personality altogether. But that is exactly the thing that every true spiritual system encourages the individuals to do, to go beyond also their own limitations. That is the main task we need to do. When we can do this step by step, and like I said before, we do that as from the situation and life's configuration, so to say, where we are now. That's our starting point. We don't need to go elsewhere. We deal with it from where we are. And it is possible for each and every one of, them, of us because we all have the spark of that essence which allows us to indeed go there. And so I hope um, I was able to come at least also convey that to all of you. And I must say you are a very, a very kind audience. And I discovered yesterday, since we are, and Shikar knows about it as well, we are in the middle of preparing for the international convention and I discovered that I actually very badly miss Adyar. Oh, yeah. I'll not be able to go there. And I trust that some of you will have the same feeling. So I am very glad with your background, Shikar. <laughs> It's our pleasure and honor, Catalina and myself. There, yeah, if you want, we can keep sending you some images of Adia. Yes, please. <laughs> and you know, I think that that feeling is mutual because many people all around the world are missing Adia, and hopefully, soon, sometime, uh, we'll be meeting in person again. Yes. And we hope. we hope. And thank you once again on behalf of Pragya CS Studio and all our audience. We would like to thank Sister Sabine, who took time and effort from her busy work schedule preparation for international convention and took this talk. And I know you are busy in recording talks for conventions and doing all the management. So we really extend our heartfelt gratitude to you and explaining in such an inspirational manner. That's real, not just through your words, but through your presence. So that's very uh, wonderful. And a gift from God. It's not my merit. I receive <laughs> it from the Creator. Yes. And it's a gift for all of us that you shared that. Thank you. And we also thank all our delegates who joined this session and to, through their interactions and queries, they made this session a very vital one. And before we proceed for the closing prayers, just uh, uh, information for the next week uh, program, we are going to have uh, on next Sunday, that is 21st November, same 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time and 11.30 a.m. GMT, Madras Theosophical Federation and Pragya CS Studio cordially invite you to a talk in English on Living from the Center by Sister Sonal Murli, who many of us are already familiar with. She's the director at Adyar Theosophical Academy in TS Adyar. So that is going to be another 
uh, inspiring and thought-provoking talk like today. So please do join us next Sunday, 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And now let us all come together with all the peace and goodwill that we are feeling after this session. Let us use all our willpower and thought power to share it with the whole manifestation for the welfare of all beings. Oh, may all become happy. May none fall ill. May all see auspiciousness everywhere. May none ever feel sorrow. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you once again, everyone. Have a great weekend, an inspiring weekend, and be an inspiration to everyone. Namaste from Adiyatu.